Welcome back. It's Dave and Andrew here with Greenleaf. And today uh, we're back on the retail discussion topic, but it's been four years since we started acquiring our retail assets. So we're going to cover some of the things we've learned over that time frame, and then look into what we think the future of retail holds. And we've got a new chair for today. So you got a fancy chair that, that you're oh, getting. I'm in the fancy chair too. You're in the fancy chair. And I will say that couch. Um, this is four years of, of me being a Greenleaf, and this is a very big day of, of reviewing what we've done over the last yeah. four years. Because it's been exciting. Is, we went from zero to where we are now in, in four years, and it's been an amazing journey with, yeah. with, uh, with Greenleaf so and the team. So let's figure out, like, what's the first deal that we bought? The first, it was back in 2018. First deal, yeah, because we started uh, in 18. That's when we signed our agreement, and our first deal closed November 7th, 2018, and it was uh, our Zaxby's in Powder Springs location, and it was our... That was our first operator relationship as well? Uh, yes, and it was a, a, a relationship I had before Greenleaf, and then I just brought into Greenleaf, and so we've done now, um, we're on, his, our, on our third deal with him right now, and we're constantly looking at other, purchasing yeah. other Zaxby's, and Zaxby's is one of our favorite brands. Uh, we have a favorite operator, and um, so that's how that's how we all started. And you, I mean, you owned the Zaxby's prior to joining Greenleaf, though, too. You owned one. right, right. So in 2017, I uh, I sold all my apartment complexes. In fact, that's how I got involved with Greenleaf. That Josh uh, knew me from my apartment complex. I sold out my apartment complex in 2017, and I uh, I used to laugh about how I did laundry and grocery <laughs> shopping for a year, and then that was fully working. There's a lot more work that goes into apartment management than there is. Y yes. Retail. There's still work, but it, it's just different. Well, I sold my different. job in 2017, and then um, and then Josh, got a new one. And then I got a new one. And Josh came to me in 2018 and said, "Hey, we want you to do this real retail thing in Greenleaf, only a lot more of it." And yeah, I said, so, "Sure, why not?" And so first deal 2018, and since then we've we've done 18 deals. 18 Eight deals in four, just over four years. Yeah, 18 deals. That's so what is that total? I mean, our our deals. On the retail side, you know, retail deals are not typically ten or fifteen million dollars a pop. So they're they're uh, in a more manageable price point, but right, but we still right. done a good amount of volume. Right, like Dollar Generals could be a million, million five, and we love our Dollar Generals, but you have to do a lot of them. But every yeah. single Dollar General we've done, we've done really well on, and we make money on. We've purchased about forty-five million overall in our eighteen million dollar in our eighteen deals, and um, of the eighteen over the past four years, we've sold five. And uh, do you know how many states we're in? Can you guess? Well, I know we opened up two new states uh, through this. So over the years, Greenleaf has been pretty focused on the southeast and, and making sure that we didn't expand our footprint too far since we are an operator, an owner-operator of all of our deals. With the retail deals, there's a little less operational intensity. We're not normally doing day-to-day -day maintenance. So we got two new states uh, since we ventured into re uh, retail. Yes, and so we're in six states right now, six states. We're in Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Kentucky, uh, Texas, and what am I missing? I don't know. You said those really fast. But <laughs> Kentucky <laughs> and Texas. Tennessee, Tennessee. Yes. Uh, Kentucky and Texas were the two new ones that we added. Uh, and, we, and we really added those in 2022 when, we've, when we got our first acquisitions in those states. And that's something we're able to do with the retail side is we're able to kind of be that expansionary uh, look into other states and other footprints. Our deals in Texas, we've got, we've got one in Colleen, we have one in Houston, and these are typically further away than we would normally operate, but being retail, we're able to get to those fairly easily uh, in the markets they are, and our operational requirements aren't too heavy there. So we're e able to get to them pretty frequently and see how things are going. Right, and um, you know, very important too, our. Um our footprint inside Greenleaf is a lot different. So we're able to do a lot more with a lot less of a footprint and a lot less management, a lot less people involved. And it's a lot easier yeah. for us to buy one $3 million Applebee's than buying a $3 million apartment complex. The work involved in a $3 million apartment complex is a factor of 10 yeah, so higher. Let's think about some of the lessons we learned on how we're acquiring these and how we're acquiring them uh, in volume and throughout multiple states. So uh, in anything you're doing, if you do do it once, it's like, okay, maybe there's some challenges there. But as you start replicating that process and learning from it, uh, there's a good amount of lessons learned over that time frame. So right. what do you think some of the key takeaways uh, as we've looked at buying all of these different assets in these states? 
let's think a little bit about the lessons that we've learned over this past four years. So we've, we bought 18 deals. We spent about $45 million uh, of investment on these assets, and that came with a lot of lessons. We learned a lot of good things over those, over those years. Yes, and, and what we've learned is that investors love cash flow. I mean, when, when I you think get, everyone likes cash flow. Everyone likes <laughs> investors, yes, non-investors. Yes. I think cash but flow we change, is we appreciated. Changed, we changed the typical model of a, of a green leaf deal, where you know you buy it, you fix it up, and then you sell it and you get your check. Yeah. And you know, green leaf deals would cash flow, but they, they would you have to fix something first yep. before it cash flows. Here, you're getting you're getting a check the quarter after closing, and you're getting a, a check pretty much every quarter until you close. And so it's a little bit of a different animal, and it's been a great it's been a great experience for a lot of investors because they they appreciate the consistency of receiving a regular dividend yeah. on their investment. So value add in retail is different than value add in, in a lot of other asset types, or at least the value add that we're doing. So value add in retail, we're starting with an asset that has in place cash flow, and we're mostly creating value through renegotiating of leases. You know what the most fun thing is for me? when we're turned down for an offer and then the broker comes back to us two or three weeks later and says, Hey, we want to reconsider you because their first buyer who was paying the most amount of money isn't, isn't there, isn't there. They disappeared on them. And so I always love being the second and third position on a deal. And we've learned that's okay because you know what? Most of the time they actually do come back because they know we're, we're a more reliable closer than perhaps John Smith who just has some money and he's just trying to invest in real estate because he's done this two other times and he thinks he could do it again. Yeah. So let's think about uh, other lessons or other, other points that uh, we can take away from purchasing these types of assets. And you mentioned the lower impact or lower head count to operate. So these are a great uh, way to acquire cash flow without a lot of active management. Right. So if you look at dollar per employee, dollar of revenue per dollar of employee, the ratio is much, much higher for for triple net deals and our double net deals inside yeah. retail because the footprint, the management footprint is a lot less. You're getting a phone call every few months about the landscaper needs to do something or the, uh, uh, the, the gutters have to be cleaned. It's a lot different model than, than, a, than an apartment complex when you're called about the toilet clogging up. We don't yeah. get toilet clogged we're phone not, calls. Yeah, so most retail assets, we're not actively managing day-to-day -day operations. So most of the time they don't want a a Greenleaf team member coming in there and performing work. But on the other standpoint, uh, we have responsibilities that some of the Dollar Generals, you know, we have to be responsible for parking lot and roofs. So these are very clearly outlined. So I think it's important to just understand if you're looking at a retail deal, what lease you're signing, what are your requirements that you have to do? Because you've got to be on top of a couple things. Just right. not, you're not responsible for the entirety of the deal like you would be in a typical apartment or residential asset. And, you know, a couple other silly, not, they're not silly, but a couple other things we learned is that people really appreciate integrity and honesty. And, you know, it, it, it kind of goes without saying for some people, but some people you actually have to remind them that, you know, we do this and we're, we are playing the game with them. So we, we, we have yeah. our, own, our own, like, uh, how much debt have we both signed on over the years? A lot of... A lot yeah, of most of the debt that's placed uh, in retail has a level of recourse. Right. So, you know, we're doing this, we're, we're, we're uh, not only do we have, do we make sure that all of our investors feel like we're being uh, honest and have full integrity with them, but we're doing it with our vendors and our brokers and, I mean, everyone involved in the full cycle of a transaction. We are not the people who play games. Yeah. I think you can, uh, you can lose a lot of credibility quickly by making some short-sighted poor decisions. And, yeah. And so that's, that's not us. And yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that's one of the reasons I'm here yeah. because this company operates with full transparency, integrity. It's, in fact, we're, you're about to re-release our... Uh, we're going to update our, our values that are going our out values. on our website. It's going yeah. to be right in our values. And um, it's always nice for deals. Very important. I said this before, but, you know, be patient. Yeah. Because it, if we don't... Sometimes the best deals you do are the deals you don't do. Another point, uh, too, is just enjoying what you're doing. Right. We have a retail team that predominantly you're working with, David Weissman. Look, who, at, look at David's smile on that. On that on we've that, got uh, some pictures up here. We've got to put this one up on the screen of David having a good time in, uh, out there. You know, we're always going out to the different retail sites. We see a bunch of them, and you've got to enjoy what you're doing. If and you David's, don't enjoy it, you shouldn't be doing it. David went to our Taco John's in Kentucky and had a, had a large Diet Coke and had a blast there just looking around and saying, hey, 
Was that one of his road trips? He's done a bunch of these road trips. He's, he's done a bunch of road trips. Over to different and, the, sites. And, and this is when he went to Princeton, Kentucky for, for the Taco John's. I guess I, we could add that as a lesson. If you like road trips, retail, retail could be the asset type for you. Yes, yeah. And David has fun, as you can see, if you look at the smile on his face. All right, so those, those are some of the lessons that we've learned over the years here. And I want to dive into just kind of like what has our investment performance been over this time frame? So, so we have a track record now because we've actually sold five we, deals and our, our track record is good. The track records really can't start until you exit a deal. So we have exited five assets at this point. And our last one that we did really right at the end it was of the, 2022. It was the, like two days before the end of the year, we closed our dollar general. It was, it was the last working day. I mean, it was Friday. I think Before. it was technically it might have been Thursday or Technically Wednesday, Thursday, but, but yeah. We it was snuck, right there. We snuck, snuck it one in. in right at the end of the year here in 2022. So we've now exited five deals. Um, and overall, we've seen our average IRR of over 30%. Our average is 34%. 34% overall project return for every single deal we've done. So we, and, and you know what? Our, our big not-so-good deal was 14%. Yeah, and if that we, one... That was one of the deals where we didn't have a lease renewal that went into it. Right, but honestly, at fourteen percent, I think I personally still would take that return. all day. Yeah. So yeah. most of our other deals is like, how do we get thirty-four percent IRR? Or what were we doing? That's not a, a retail deal where you buy something at a seven and a half cap and you sell it at a seven and a half cap. Obviously, there's not going to be an IRR over thirty percent in that scenario. Uh, to realize the higher RRs, you have to do the value component, and that has come through execution of leases. Right, so execution of leases and also extending leases. So we make a little bit of a trade, we maybe give a little bit of a rent discount and then an extended lease. So we go from a two-year lease to a, a, a like a 15-year lease or a 16-year right. lease like yeah. with IHOP Spring, and the property is worth much more because the property's value is going to be based on the lease term of yep. that. That, ex that extended lease term, that is something that is more financeable. You can get a longer term loan. You have longer predictability of cash flow. And for some investors, that is paramount to what they're looking for in their investment portfolio is that long term stability. So while you might wonder, like, who would buy uh, something that has a 15 year lease or why would they be interested in that versus buying a one year lease? You know, anyone watching this and you know, you're going you're gonna to fall somewhere in that spectrum of, do I want a short-term lease or do I want a long-term lease? And in, I'll, I'll in take the long-term lease, yeah. Yeah, we, we see a lot of value in those longer-term leases because we have that predictability of cash flow. Right. So, you know, for next for us, you know, what are we doing now? I mean, market's changing. And so we're, we're, changing you know, our, we're, we're changing our buying habits. We're changing our structures. You know, think about, you know, what's next for us. Because yeah, I mean, we can look at what's in the immediate term, right, where we at least have a couple more months where we know rates are going to be rising. And then in theory, I mean, I don't have a magic eight ball to exactly say what it's, we should get a magic eight ball and just answer based on that. But yeah, if we can't tell investors, we're doing if, the eight ball. if interest rates were to, <laughs> to flatten or they would go up or down from there, then it's like, what are you doing to prepare for call it one to four years out well, from now. Like we look out eight years now from the start of this. We're always looking at how we're buying deals and are we buying this deal right now with all the information we know in a smart way. So we have to put the smart buying back in our, in our, in our, in our discussions. And even this morning, we had a very long discussion about how do we buy something in a rising interest rate market when yeah. cap rates are, or we know they're gonna change, although cap rates haven't changed yet. And so how do we buy inside that market? And so you have to be conservative, you have to add, uh, room for error, and you have to just buy knowing that things are going to change and know that if something changes, you're still okay. Yeah, let, I want to mention or, or, or talk about that a little bit. Like, yes, rates have gone up, but we haven't seen cap rates really change yet. A little not bit. Not in a significant yeah, way. a little so, bit, but not a lot. You know, uh, we, we exited our one deal at a 5.7 cap, and, and this is at the end of 2022, uh, still exiting it at fairly attractive uh, cap rates. Now, Starbucks and that kind of stuff, that's super high retail or a Chick-fil-A is even lower. But uh, we're still seeing good cap rates. And now we expect those to increase on the exits uh, as well. But I think when we look at like, how are we going to do, do a deal going forwards or what are we looking for? We need to make sure we have a, at least a minimum rate of return that is surpassing what you can receive in the, in the risk-free right. world. I, if, if I can go to a bank right now and get 3 or 4% just by putting my money in the bank, whatever we're offering, 
has to provide much more value than that. Yeah, and the downside has to be three to four percent or whatever the savings right, rate so the is floor, within the near terms. The yeah. floor should be what the bank is going to give you, and then we're going from there. We're going up from there. Yeah. Now that may take a little bit for sellers in the market to uh, to adapt to that mentality. That's why we're still seeing really low cap rates. I mean, if we're still seeing cap rates that are five and a half, six percent, those are going to have to come up in the in the near future if a deal is going to transact where we have a floor cash on cash of three or three and a half percent. I almost don't even want to say this, but I just kind of look forward because you know it's it's interesting what's going to happen because we have scenarios for how everything's going to move, and when things start moving, we know what we're going to do. Yeah. And so I'm looking forward to seeing where things go because finally we'll be able to make better decisions and we'll know, okay, we're following this path rather than this path. Yeah. And when we look at retail deals, there's a lot of different lease terms that you can see or that you can come across as you're looking at these. And that's going to be pretty important over the next couple of years, especially if you're signing a lease now, is it a lease that is flat rent? You know, some leases are, are fixed rent out for 10 years. Some have annual escalations. Like, what are you doing in that lease to make sure that it's, it's best situated for rising interest rates or an environment that has higher cap rates? Um, those things have to be taken into consideration, certainly, when looking at what, what a lease renewal looks like or anything that you're going to buy. Yes. yes. So, um, any other final words? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's still lots of, you know, there, there's lots of opportunity, although it's coming in different ways and, and it's, uh, it's more unique in how it's going to be found. Um, it's going to be highly dependent on, too, on what operators are out there saying, we're going to expand in 2023, yep. 2024, uh, or are we going to just maintain our footprint? And, and when I mean operators, I mean brand operators. So if we look at uh, restaurants, what chains are going to expand, which ones are going to Right. Stay flat. We, we would like to own like 10 more Zaxby's if we could, but the problem is finding those 10 more Zaxby's. In fact, we've looked at a lot of them and we can't make a business case for them. So we, we say no, and those are the deals we're not doing. And those are, yeah. you know, the visibility for those. But Zaxby's is a brand too that's, that's looking to expand. We, right. We've mentioned that uh, really over the past three years with, with yeah. Dollar General, four years. And they're even looking to expand even further uh, than what they've done. So there's a lot of brands that are looking to expand. Those are the brands that... Uh, we think it makes most sense to work with. I mean, I think it makes most sense to work with them. Contraction is always contraction. We talk about that with population, contraction of population, contraction of uh, economic centers. Like if your city is contracting right. or if a brand is contracting, those are very hard things to operate through. So we're not looking to place investment dollars in any of the markets that are contracting or any of the cities or any of the brands. We're looking to, to it's kind of roll downhill versus try to struggle uphill, I think is the easiest yeah. way to look at it. So overall, the past four years have been pretty darn exciting. Yeah, We've learned a ton. I've, and I've, I've, it's been a great time. And, you know, I just want to say, you know, first of all, thank you for bringing me on. I had a great yeah, time. Thank you awesome. to all our investors who've actually trusted us with their, uh, with with their, their money, hard-earned money. With their yep. hard-earned money. And thank you for the confidence. And, uh, you know, Josh and David, David are not here right now, but they send their they're thanks to They're a big part you. of the team. They're I'm a big part of the happen. team. And, you know, we've, maybe they're out on a road trip right now looking at Maybe stuff. they're looking at another Taco John's or another, <laughs> another deal right now. But um, you know, it's, been, it's been a great ride. So thank you all for your, uh, for your confidence in us. Yeah. So tune back in. We're going to continue to have investment tips that go through things we're learning, things we're seeing out in the market. Also, operational updates on all of our deals. When we, we learn something unique and how we're operating with an asset, we're going to have more of those updates out as well. So thank you very much. For more tips on operating and investing in real estate, please check us out at greenleafmanagement.com or find us on YouTube and Spotify.